So we will start today and, as usual, continue next week talking about matching models and mechanisms. And this is one more of those fields which is not directly related to mechanism design, but tangentially kind of it feels somewhat related and somewhat similar. And we will, we will actually arrive eventually to a complete um, a point of tangency. But to give you some introduction, so the matching in general is a very old field. It's a huge field, broad field, so a lot of models, a lot of papers. And it's a, the fact that it's an old field means that it kind of even predates game theory to some extent. So it started in the 60s. And the point that you will see today, will the model that you will see today, will probably make no sense from game theory point of view. It will, it will seem to make sense, but it actually won't. So this might be the reason uh, why, it's, why it's that, because game theory was not really a thing back then. Or game theory was developing in parallel. So for, uh, for these lectures, for these topics, I will use this textbook by Roth and Sotomayor. I told you at the start of the course that you do not really need to have this textbook. I tried to fit everything related onto the slides. But if you are if if you are interested in matching or if you will become interested in matching, then this textbook is a nice entry point. So I, I was reading it last year when I was preparing these slides, and it's just it's so cool because it's 50 propositions per chapter, and all of them are really insightful. All of them are not about, you know, this function has this property. No, they are actually insightful. They have some implications for the real world, for the matching mechanisms, or for the set of matches that you can achieve, and so on. But uh, you should be wary, not wary as in tired, but wary as in cautious, that uh, this textbook is from 1990 which, to think of it, was 30 years ago. So the literature has come some way since then. And you will not get to the frontier by reading this textbook. Cool. So by now, you may probably be wondering, what the hell is matching? And we will start by introducing the very classic matching model. At this point, I should kind of take a second and give uh, your political correctness disclaimer. So as I said, this model was originally proposed in the 60s, and I will present it in the, in the framing in which it was originally presented. Many things have changed since then, so I, I, will, not say, I will say that this model does not represent my views or probably the author's views either, but we will stick to that original story because it is a simple story, and it gives us nice not notation to use. So it's notation is convenient. But the story is, we have a set of men, we have a set of women, and we want to marry them. <laughs> In particular, so yeah, we have set big M of men, we have set another set of uh, big W of women. We will say that every agent in these two sets has some kind of preference over agents in the opposite set. So men has, have some preferences over women. Women have some preferences over uh, men. And the one kind of twist we will have is that we will also add uh, self to these preferences. So basically what this means here is uh, men 1 would prefer to be matched to woman B better than to woman one, better to, than to woman two, and so on. And somewhere in that ranking, we will have man one himself. What this will mean is, man one prefers to be matched to himself, meaning to stay alone, rather than being matched with any of the other women uh, lower in the rank. The same obviously applies for women. We give them the opportunity to stay alone as well. Yeah. And for now, we will start with the assumption that all preferences are commonly known. So this will relate kind of more to the social choice theory. We know all players' all prayers preferences, and we're just trying to figure out what to do. 
how to match these players with these preferences. But this time we will also talk a little bit about what to do if the preferences are not known. In particular, our goal, the object that we are trying to calculate, is called matching. And the matching is, well, exactly what you think. It matches men to women, it matches women to men. We will look at, again, very orthodox families with only one man and one woman who are matched to one another, or uh, once again, people can be matched to themselves. So from the formal point of view, a matching is a one-to-one -one function from M and W to M and W. So for every man, it prescribes either a woman or uh, this man himself. Similarly, for every woman, the matching prescribes either a man or this exact woman. And the kind of uh, sanity restriction is every person should be matched to the person who is matched to them. So if man 1 is matched to woman 2, then woman 2 must be matched to man 1. It's just kind of formal restriction on the a mathematical restriction on the, on the object that we are looking for. And so we want to find a kind of a good matching uh, given player's preferences. And the definition of good is when we start having trouble. I guess the one thing that you can think of is some kind of Pareto optimality. And we will eventually get to that, but we will start with an even simpler kind of requirement, which is we want our matching to be kind of an equilibrium. So we want to tell these people what to do, and they should not be willing to uh, say, no, this is bullcrap, let's go and do our own matching. And this relates to the concept of stability, which we will look at at the next slide. But before then, let's take a look at the examples of actual problems where this kind of model can be applied. Because matching markets are not really that huge these days, unless you consider Tinder matching market. But then the assumptions do not kind of fit of commonly known preferences. So the actual original application was also not the marriage markets, but rather the um, US medical internships market. So basically the job market for um, medical students once they graduate. It was a, a bit of a horrible mess in the 40s and the 50s. The hospitals were just competing for students so intensely that I think uh, medical students got their job offer at the end of their second year or at the beginning of their second year. So basically when they knew nothing about uh, medicine yet and where the hospitals could not really evaluate them yet. So the medical association decided to do something with that and they came up with this kind of uh, centralized mechanism that we will also come up with completely independently of them. Now the modern job market in economics works in kind of similar way. It is a pretty centralized uh, system in which universities who are employing professors and postdocs and also some of the private companies who have use for people with economics PhD, which is not that many companies. Um, so these companies are on one side of the market and they are looking for, well, basically econ PhDs. And uh, we're trying to come up with a match. So this market is decentralized. There is no kind of principle that does the matching, although some attempts have been made. And uh, there is some degree of centralization in that there is one platform, there is one venue where all the interviews are held uh, two days in the year, and so on. Another application which is kind of more universal is allocating heterogeneous workers across projects or maybe resources across branches. So if you think of a consultancy firm, you have a bunch of consultants with specializations in different kinds of stuff. And then a project comes up saying, you know, this project is about this. And then you need to assemble a team of consultants uh, such that they are both proficient in this kind of field, but they have complementary skills. One is good at 
doing the slides, another one is good at presenting. Maybe someone else is good at research. Uh, yeah, similarly, you can allocate resources across branches for a large tra transnational multi outlet firm. You think, you know, which shop is currently in most in need of this particular product or which factory is most in need of this particular input if you have scarce inputs. And you can even think that resources in this later story have some kind of preferences, which is basically the cost of taking this resource to that plant. So resources do not like to be transported, you can think. Cool. Uh, one special case that we can consider is that in which exactly one side has preference, but the other side does not have any preferences on whom to be matched with. Uh, yeah, for example, school admissions. Schools, you can think that they have preferences over students, but we are trying to pretend that they don't. So it's really more about stu uh, students' preferences over schools. Kidney exchange is another one of the big canonical applications of matching models. And there you can think that, well, kidneys do not have preferences over whom to be matched with, but the, the recipients do want to get better kidney. Then again, the donors might have preferences. Cool. And finally, allocation of items will be another problem which we cannot run away from. So it will chase us even in this uh, matching story. So we will talk a little bit about the allocating items across different players. So these are examples of settings in which matching models can be applied. Now, let's go back to our objective. Our objective is attempting to obtain a good matching between the two sides of the market. And we are still at the stage of finding out what good means. And this is exactly this slide. So first of all, we do not want the players to kind of say, this matching sucks, I will stay alone. But this is the minimal deviation that we think these players have. And this is captured by the individual rationality. And you can think of it as exposed individual rationality in this case. So agents can first learn whom they are matched with, and then they decide whether to walk away or not. So we say that the uh, player X's matching must be better or weakly better than staying alone. This actually should be a weak preference. So that's our minimal requirement. But we have some more. In particular, we would like, we recognize that the people might not just run away and be on their own, but they might find someone else to run away with. And this will be our second uh, requirement. So we will say that a blocking pair of a man and a woman is such a pair who would prefer to run away together rather than stay in the matching with their current matches. And then we define our concept of stability as the absence of such blocking pairs. So we say that our matching that we got is stable if nobody wants to run away with anybody. And it is individually rational as well. And these will be our main requirements at this first stage of our exploration. So let's, uh, let's look at an example. Let's say we have three men and three women, M1, M2, M3, W1, W2, W3. And their preferences are as follows. Man 1 prefers woman 2 to woman 1 to woman 3. Man 2 prefers woman 1 to woman 3 to woman 2. And here is 1 to 3. For women, the preferences are 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, and 1, 3, 2. And let us consider 
two examples of matches. So let's take some matching mu, which we can write as just woman one with man one, woman two with man two. And woman three with man three. And I would like you to at this point take five minutes and uh, look at this matching and see is it stable or not? And if not, what is the, uh, the blocking pair? We will assume that staying single is always the worst alternative for all of them. So we'll say that man one, man two. And three, woman one, woman two, woman three. So let's see, let's hear it. Has anyone arrived to a conclusion? That's right, thank you. Man one and woman two are indeed a blocking pair in this uh, in this in this matching. So if we mark everybody um, in this preference list, so woman one is matched. Man 1 is matched to woman 1, man 2 is matched to woman 2, man 3 is matched to woman 3, woman 1, man 1, woman 2, m2, woman 3, m3. So indeed, you see that man 2 and woman 2 are really unhappy. They would prefer anyone else. So if anyone prefers, they would like to be rematched with that. And man 3 is also, um, is also really unhappy here. So I guess you can already find another blocking pair, which would be woman two and m three. Uh, woman two and m three. But it's true that another blocking pair is man one and woman two. This and this alternative. Now there might be getting a little too many circles on the board. <laughs> But it's true. So part of the exercise was also to show you that there, there's not really that good of a way to find blocking pairs. You basically have to brute force over everybody, see whom they're matched with. There, is there anybody who would uh, prefer to be rematched? Is this desire reciprocal? Is this desire mutual? Which is another thing that we would like to satisfy. So yeah, the definition is very intuitive. The problem of finding a blocking pair is a bit tedious. Therefore, the problem of finding a stable matching is probably also tedious. But as we will show, it is not quite that bad. So stable matchings have some desirable properties, and there is actually a very simple algorithm which allows us to find some of those stable matchings. But so far, we looked at this example, and we saw that, you know, we we saw what a matching looks like. We saw how to find a blocking pair. And the answer is brute force. And the answer is, is there a good way to find stable matchings? And why do we even care about stable matchings? And this is kind of the, maybe one of the reasons of the success of this literature, is that it could provide these nice examples. It could provide these nice answers. So by the way, this example will have a stable matching, but I will not yet tell you what it is. But it is in the slides if you're really impatient. So stability is, as I mentioned, is effectively an equilibrium concept for, for matching problems. It's basically we, we have this notion of equilibrium in which nobody wants to run away. So it is a kind of equilibrium of some kind of game where players have these actions, but we are never really defining any explicit game, right? So it kind of makes sense from a game theory perspective, but not really. So maybe if we treated this as a proper mechanism design problem, we could have freedom in designing some kind of sanctions for leaving the prescribed matching. Uh, we could forcibly marry agents, so we could eliminate those uh, deviations. We, we could eliminate those outside options in some way. But here we count, so we have to find a stable match. Once again, not dealing with any private information yet. So this is effectively kind of a social choice question. We are trying to find 
a good matching given some profile preferences. But you can think that these are players types, they define players preferences, and we're just observing players types for the moment. But we're looking for a matching function mu, which could work for any type profile. This is our goal. So the first big success is that the problem was solved due to the mathematician's definition of solving problems, meaning that they have proved that the solution exists for every marriage market. I guess they have not shown that it's unique, so they have not solved the problem completely. But the stable matching will not be unique. So a stable matching exists for every marriage market, by which I mean one-to-one -one matching with two sides of the market, in our case, men and women. This is a very nice result. Again, yeah, mathematicians really like these kinds of results. But as it turns out, it's not really that robust. So as long as you make a step left, step right from the marriage model, everything breaks down. So some examples of where the result will break down and where the existence of a stable match will not be guaranteed. First of all, roommate problem, where you have only one side of the market that matches within each other, within itself. So basically, you have a set of students, you have a bunch of two-person rooms, you can think three-person rooms, doesn't really matter, and the you have to match students into rooms. There is no solution to that. So at least there is no stable matching that we can generate given profile of everybody's preferences. There will, you can come up with an example in which there will always be a blocking pair. Okay, three-sided matching, broadly speaking, is just another uh, class of problems where stable matching may not exist. And you can think of three-sided marriage markets in principle. But yeah, the example that I came up with last year is you are assembling a team to clear out a dungeon, and you need a tank, a damage dealer, and a healer and to split in triples for quest dungeons. So basically, there are three groups of, of characters, of the heroes that you can select, and you need one of each. There, you do not have a single matching. So MMORPGs cannot be solved. Then there is the question of many-to-one matching, which is present in some of the examples that I gave you, namely one firm can hire many workers. So we have a set of firms, we have a set of workers, but many workers can match to one firm. In that case, if the firm has preferences over sets of employees, rather than just independent preferences over um, each individual employee, we need very, very strong conditions on firm's preferences for this theorem to hold, but otherwise stable matching may not exist. And you can think that this is a very natural kind of thing, right? I, I do not, my startup will not benefit from having a social media manager, a good social media manager, if it does not have an engineer that does all the job. So I want to hire them in the bundle of two, but I do not value having one or the other. I guess I could, have, I could value having the engineer. Uh, peer effects is a related thing. In again, in many-to-one matching, if the firm has preference over a bundle of employees, I said the, there's no hope. But even if this is not the case, but the workers have preferences over whom to work with, as opposed to just who to work for, no stable matching. And uh, you can buy the textbook and read it for particular examples of preferences under which this non-existence non manifests. But let's stick to the marriage, mo to the marriage model. Let's say we're content with these uh, two sides and one-to-one -one matching, and we, are, we want to find the stable matching at least in this market. There is a solution for that. And it's called the deferred acceptance algorithm. So you can read the, kind of the procedure of the deferred acceptance algorithm on the slide, but let's not do that. Let's instead just run deferred acceptance algorithm on this example and learn 
by example of how it works. So in the deferred acceptance algorithm, what happens is we first of all select one side of the market to be proposing. Let's again stick to the framework of the 60s and let's say that men are proposing to women. Then what happens is we give every man kind of a some token, a flower or a ring that they can use to propose to the to the woman they like. And we will say that in the first round, everybody just will propose to their favorite woman. So man two will propose to woman two, man two will propose to woman one, man three will propose to woman one. At that point, once all the proposals are made, we ask women to decide, to say that they can only keep one flower or one ring, and they must give all the others back. They do not have to commit yet, but they cannot hold more than one offer. So let's see what we got in this market. So we got proposition to woman two from man one. We have two propositions to woman one from M2 and M3. So in this case, woman three got no proposals, unfortunately, so she's just sitting there sad. Woman two has one proposition, one ring from man one, and her choice is between keeping that, holding on to that, or rejecting that, in which case she's kind of implicitly holding on to the offer from herself. Holding uh, to an offer from herself is the bad one, so she holds on to the offer from man one. Woman one has two offers, just a second, from these two men. So as we said, she can, you can think that they have yeah, proposals from themselves. So woman one can only hold on to one proposal. In this case, the best for her is M M3. So, so she holds on to that and rejects the two others. So she rejects M2, she rejects herself, and so M2 is rejected. He gets his ring back in round one. I'll finish the algorithm and then take the questions. This completes round one, and then we kind of iterate on that. So in the beginning of every round, all of our men who have their ring with them, who have their hand and heart to offer, do that. And they do that to the best woman who has not rejected them yet. And at that point, kind of the same thing uh, repeats. So here, men to propose to woman three, meaning that she got an offer from man two. She rejects her offer and holds on to man two's ring. And at this point, you see that in the next round, no man will have um, the freedom to propose. They have they all have their offers being held onto, which means that no new proposals will be made in this round, which means that the algorithm has stopped, and we will take this as our matching. So the claim is that this algorithm will always generate a stable match. So in our example, the algorithm stopped after two rounds, uh, but you could say that what if men two proposed to woman two instead, if they were flipping his preferences, so then woman two would have had these two tokens, so she would reject M2 as well, and so on. So the question is, uh, why, why are the agents behaving so non-strategically in this case? Why are they not forward-looking, thinking that, well, if I reject this offer today, this is how uh, the game will proceed, and maybe I will end up with something better? This is another very good point. This is another thing that we will be talking about. Indeed, this is just an algorithm. This says that what should be done in order to obtain a stable matching. But what we will see is that if you really just take this as a game and you give it to the players to play, they will not want to follow the algorithm. They will want to do exactly what you said. 
and they will want to be strategic about how they propose and uh, accept and reject. Actually, not about how they propose, but only about how they accept and reject. So I claimed that the deferred acceptance algorithm always produces a stable match. So the game itself is not does uh, in the game itself is not an equilibrium for the players to play according to how it prescribes. But if we, the designer, select this matching using this algorithm, then the end result would be stable. So it would be kind of the equilibrium outcome for the players. And we can even go through the simple proof. And not only is, the simple, is this proof simple enough for us to go through it, but it's simple enough to have it on the slide rather than write it on the board and go more slowly and explain it. So basically what we need to show is that in this resulting matching, there are no blocking pairs. And the way to see this is by contradiction. So suppose there exists a blocking pair. And let us use our example for that. So in our case, kind of the only blocking pair that we could have had is the one uh, for that involves woman one and man two. Because this is kind of the only possible improvement for all men. They would not agree to anything else. So the blocking pair must involve somebody to whom one of our men proposed and was rejected. But what this means is that if our man proposed to this woman and he was rejected, then this woman had some better offer already. And since then, her uh, situation could have only improved, so she could have gotten better offers, or the, uh, the algorithm could have stopped. But either way, this woman would not be willing to form a blocking pair with this man. The end. So we already have two cool results, saying, first of all, stable matches always exist. Secondly, we always have a simple way to find the stable matches. We still do not really know uh, much about the set of stable matches, so let's talk about that. So as we mentioned, we can run, run the algorithm with our sides flip, flipped, such that women are proposing. And as I've already uh, spoiled you, these two matchings will be in separate positions in the set of all stable matches. In particular, we can um, yeah, say a lot about the whole set of stable matches and where the, these deferred acceptance matches lie within it. So firstly, we will call a matching men optimal if all men prefer this given matching to any other matching, to any other stable matching in particular. And vice versa, stable matching is worst for men if all men agree that this stable matching is the worst in the history of stable matchings maybe ever. So, and the same for women. There is a women, women optimal and women worst matching. Now, it's not guaranteed that these are well-defined concepts, that we can always find a man optimal matching. Because men might disagree, you know, I prefer this one because I'm matched better here. The other man might say, you know, I am matched better in this other match. Theorem says that, well, I don't know, maybe it's a proposition. Who even, who even keeps track? That not only these uh, ma optimal and worst matchings always exist, they are always well defined, but they are also our deferred acceptance matching. So it is exactly the case that. The matching obtained by men proposing deferred acceptance algorithm, mu MDA, is the optimal for men and is the worst for women, and vice versa. So everybody would like to be proposing. And uh, what are the insights that generalize nicely? Yeah. Well, all, all uh, players on every side agree on which matchings are best and worst. And men's and women's preferences over stable matchings are opposed. So preferences are aligned within the side of the market and they're opposed across the sides of the market. So this is one result about the set of stable matchings and about kind of its critical points. 
but we actually can say a lot more about this the whole set of stable meshes and I will draw a quick sneaky picture that will try to explain this set but really it's it's more about the math so let's suppose we have a kind of a two by two market two men and two women so let's say that these two axes represent the utilities that the two men get so this is the utility of man one I'll remove the slides this is the utility of man two suppose we have two stable machines that are um, like this the grant utilities like this then what the lattice structure tells us is that the there were there exists a matching that grants both players the minimal of the utilities and this matching will be stable and the same applies to the matching that gives both players the max of their utilities so basically you can have a set of matches like this forget about this square but here we will not be able to complete these two squares because the, the matching in which both players get the minimal utility is exactly this already and the matching in which both players get exactly the max of the two is this but for the kind of inverse diagonals we'll have that so if we have three stable matchings like that then we can also say that this 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 and this will also be stable matchings kind of like that and then we will know that these are the deferred acceptance outcomes. So this was very quick and very dirty. And there is one more thing I want to say about that, which is on top of these axes, we can put the other two axes, which will represent the utilities of women. So for women, all of the rankings between different stable machines will be exactly reversed. If all men agree that this is better than this, then all women will think it exactly opposite. Now this is it. The quick crash course into lattice theory, super modular games. It's really fun once you get into it, but it's hard to get into it. So we were talking about the sets of stable matches and I tried to give you one tiny flavor of uh, what we know about the set of stable matches and I have a little bit more on the slide just talking about this lattice structure of the set of stable matches but I will say no more now. And this is actually not the only kind of results uh, that we have about the set of stable matches. So as I told you this is one instance of there have been 50 different propositions all saying smart and cool and interesting things but I just cannot go through all of them so some examples is we know that in the set of stable matches in the marriage model the set of singles would be the same in all stable matches so it cannot be the case that I'm sad because in this stable match I'm single but there is some other stable match in which can, I can be married with someone this is not the case we also know that adding a new man to the market harms all men and helps all the women I guess in every stable match so okay, point wise we also know that uh, there is another algorithm for finding a stable matching it just we don't know what it will produce so I did not emphasize it but what you can do instead of deferred acceptance is just start from any matching you want and then check does it have a blocking pair if yes okay satisfied say these people are now matched and we somehow match everybody else is there a blocking pair now and if you go like that you will eventually arrive at a stable match and once again get the textbook see the textbook if you would like to know more now we are getting to the question that was on everybody's minds this whole time well what would happen if we as the designer do not actually know players preferences can we ask the players to 
play this game on our behalf and get to the stable matching. So question one is, uh, is deferred acceptance game or a game induced by deferred acceptance algorithm? Is it optimal to play along, alongside the algorithm? And we have already said that the answer is not really. And this is kind of the bad news. That is generally not optimal for players on the receiving side of the market to play optimally. But, well, you know, th there is also good news for some consolation, I guess. Not that it's uh, much. And it says that for the proposing side, it is actually a dominant strategy to um, propose truthfully. So, if we cannot do that, what can we do? Maybe deferred acceptance does not work, but maybe we can find some other game in which both sides of the market would have an incentive to reveal their preferences truthfully so that we can arrive to some um, stable matching, maybe some kind of compromise stable matching, uh, if we have many of them. And let's look at an example. Now we'll take a slightly different example. We will only have two players on each side, and the preferences will be such that man one prefers woman one to woman two to stay in single. Man two has the opposite kind of preference. Woman one prefers man two to man one to single. Man one to M two to single. So let's take three minutes. Really quickly run two deferred acceptance deferred acceptance algorithms and find two stable matches here. And there will only really actually be two. So if we run the men proposing deferred acceptance algorithm, what happens? Men one proposes to woman one, men two propose to woman two, everybody has one offer, so that's it. M1 is with woman one. Man 2 is with woman 2. And if women get to propose instead, woman 1 proposes to man 2, woman 2 proposes to man 1. Again, everybody has single offer, so that's it. As we are done in a single round again. So man 1 is with woman 2. Man 2 is with woman 1. So we have two stable matchings, and there will be no other stable matchings in this game. So let's first look at how uh, players can game the algorithm. So for example, if men are proposing, what kind of deviation would the women have? So once again, let's look. Men 1 propose to woman 1, men 2 propose to woman 2, meaning they have these offers. But then if at least one of the women rejects their her respective offer and kind of says that no, I'd rather stay single. So misrepresents her preference as uh, M2, W1, M1, for example, saying that W1 is actually better. I don't want to be matched with that guy. Then man one gets his token back, proposed to woman two. Woman two likes this better than her initial matching, projects man one. So man one then propose to woman one instead. So you see that by this deviation, woman one could switch from this table matching to this table matching. And so improve things for both herself and her friend. Turns out this extremely simple example is pretty much universal. So whatever game you can come up with, this kind of deviation will always break uh, whatever you think is the equilibrium in your game. So this is shown, argued, on the next slide. And I feel like I'm running even way ahead of the slides at this point. So the question is, does there exist a dominant strategy incentive compatible mechanism that leads to a stable matching in a marriage model, and the answer is no, because this 
is our universal counter example. So if in your problem, your mechanism chooses, for, uh, for example, this top matching that we considered, then woman one, then this kind of misrepresentation of preferences will always be profitable for, um, yeah, for our woman one. And woman two has the same kind of uh, deviation. If we say that, well, okay, you know, never mind, we don't like to implement this matching, we would want, if these are the preferences, we would want to implement this uh, matching generated by women proposing deferred acceptance algorithm. But in that case, men will have the same kind of uh, deviation and they would misrepresent their preferences and reject their first offers as well. So this is a tragic result, tragic day for matching theory, saying that we, we do not really have any kind of game that implements the uh, stable matching. So any questions on this so far? Why do we use deferred acceptance? There are cases in which it's fine. So firstly, in some special cases, if one side of the market does not have any particular preferences, if it's inanimate like items or kidneys or something like that, then this side does not feel the need to misrepresent its preferences. So we can use this side as the receiving side for the offers. Uh, similarly, this, everything would be fine if one side of the market has this um, has uniform preferences, meaning that all agents on that side of the market have the same preferences. For example, when universities are deciding whom to accept and there is some state exam, I don't know if there is any in Denmark, but for example, in the US, there is SAT. So universities will probably prefer somebody with the highest SAT scores. And all universities have this ranking. In that case, same thing applies. There will be unique stable matching and the, the universities will not have any kind of profitable deviation. So this counterexample would not apply because here you see uh, same players, different players on the same side of the market have different preferences. So if we can restrict our domain somewhat, then maybe deferred acceptance is an equilibrium. Cool, any other questions? then I'll go with my, my question. In this example, we have designer being completely unaware of what the player's preferences are. But what about the players? Players obviously know their own preferences, that's what we always assume. But do they know everybody else's preferences? In this example, for example, in the deviation that we considered, woman one knew that her misrepresentation of uh, preferences would result in her being matched to man two in the end. But if, for example, man two said that, well, no, I actually prefer some, I know, if preferences were different, for example, man's preferences or woman two's preferences, then this misrepresentation could not pay off. And woman one could end up being matched with herself, according to the preferences that she presented, which is the bad option for her. So the question is about what kind of preferences would work if uh, for this example. So say the alternative is this kind of preferences for M1, W1, M1, W2. If man one reports this, these preferences, then after being rejected by woman one, he will say, all right, I'll stay single, and woman one will stay single, and M2 and W2 will be matched together. So if, for example, woman one is not sure which of these two preference profiles man one has, then our impossibility result kind of breaks down. So in doing this example, and in doing this broad argument, we kind of implicitly assumed that all players know everybody's preferences. And we kind of know that 
we don't need fancy deferred acceptance for that, we can have a simpler mechanism. Suppose we have access to transfers, just for, for this brief second. So we call that the cross-verification mechanisms. The cross-verification mechanism, meaning that everybody should report everybody's preferences, because we all know that. And if everybody's reports coincide, then it's fine, this is the profile we use. If somebody's response is different from everybody else, then we kill everybody and start anew with the new Earth. <clears throat> so this is the kind of cross-verification mechanism which we can use if everybody knows everybody else's types. Which means that we, we actually have a mechanism that would work in that case. We don't need deferred acceptance. And really, if you don't have access to transfers, you can maybe try to find a very bad matching that everybody would hate. The question is how you find a matching that everybody would hate if you don't know what exactly everybody hates. So in that case, it's a little more uh, sketchy. So without transfers, we don't really know what happens. <clears throat> 